This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The following three essays were written by the Group of Russian Anarchists Abroad, a group of anarchists from Russia and Ukraine who fled Russia after the Russian Revolution and the defeat of the anarchists in the Free Territory. These essays were published in 1925 and 1926 and represent a collection of essays on organizational strategy and tactics that anarchists can use to overthrow the state and capitalism. In particular, Makhno and the Russian Anarchists Abroad outline four general principles to guide the organizational platform, and these are ideological unity, tactical unity, collective responsibility, and federalism. Organizational Platform of the General Union of Anarchists, Draft, by Nestor Makhno and others of the group of the Russian Anarchists Abroad, 1926. Introduction Anarchists Despite the force and unquestionably positive character of anarchist ideas, despite the clarity and completeness of anarchist positions with regard to the social revolution, and despite the heroism and countless sacrifices of anarchists in the struggle for anarchist communism, it is very telling that in spite of all this, the anarchist movement has always remained weak and has most often featured in the history of working class struggles not as a determining factor, but rather as a fringe phenomenon. This contrast between the positive substance and incontestable validity of anarchist ideas and the miserable state of the anarchist movement can be explained by a number of factors, the chief one being the absence in the anarchist world of organizational principles and organizational relations. In every country, the anarchist movement is represented by local organizations with contradictory theory and tactics with no forward planning or continuity in their work. They usually fold after a time, leaving little or no trace. Such a condition in revolutionary anarchism, if we take it as a whole, can only be described as chronic general disorganization. This disease of disorganization has invaded the organism of the anarchist movement like yellow fever has plagued it for decades. There can be no doubt, however, that this disorganization has its roots in a number of defects of theory, notably in the distorted interpretation of the principle of individuality in anarchism, that principle being too often mistaken for the absence of all accountability. Those enamored of self-expression with an eye to personal pleasure cling stubbornly to the chaotic condition of the anarchist movement and, in defense thereof, invoke the immutable principles of anarchism and its teachers. However, the immutable principles and teachers show the very opposite. Dispersion spells ruination. Cohesion guarantees life and development. This law of social struggle is equally applicable to classes and parties. Anarchism is no beautiful fantasy, no abstract notion of philosophy, but a social movement of the working masses. For that reason alone, it must gather its forces into one organization, constantly agitating, as demanded by the reality and strategy of the social class struggle. As Kropotkin said, quote, We are convinced that the formation of an anarchist party in Russia, far from being prejudicial to the general revolutionary endeavor, is instead desirable and useful in the highest degree. Unquote. Nor did Bakunin ever oppose the idea of a general anarchist organization. On the contrary, his aspirations with regard to organization, as well as his activities within the First Workingmen's International, give us every right to view him as an active advocate of precisely such a mode of organization. Broadly speaking, nearly all of the active militants of anarchism were against dissipated action and dreamed of an anarchist movement united by a common purpose and common tactics. It was during the Russian Revolution of 1917 that the need for a general organization was felt most acutely, since it was during the course of that revolution that the anarchist movements displayed the greatest degree of fragmentation and confusion. The absence of a general organization induced many anarchist militants to defect to the ranks of the Bolsheviks. It is also the reason why many other militants find themselves today in a condition of passivity that thwarts any utilization of their often immense capacities. We have vital need of an organization which, having attracted most of the participants in the anarchist movement, would establish a common tactical and political line for anarchism, and thereby serve as a guide for the whole movement. It is high time that anarchism emerged from the swamp of disorganization, to put an end to the interminable vacillations on the most important questions of theory and tactics, 
and resolutely move towards its clearly understood purpose and an organized collective practice. It is not enough, though, to simply state the vital need for such an organization. It is also necessary to establish a means for creating it. We reject, as theoretically and practically unfounded, the idea of creating an organization using the recipe of the synthesis, that is to say, bringing together the supporters of the various strands of anarchism. Such an organization embracing a potpourri of elements, in terms of their theory and practice, would be nothing more than a mechanical assemblage of persons with varying views on all issues affecting the anarchist movement, and would inevitably break up on encountering reality. The anarcho-syndicalist approach does not solve anarchism's organizational difficulty, since anarcho-syndicalism fails to give it priority and is mostly interested in the idea of penetrating and making headway in the world of labor. However, even with a foothold there, there is nothing more to be accomplished in the world of labor if we do not have a general anarchist organization. The only approach which can lead to a solution of the general organizational problem is, as we see it, the recruitment of anarchism's active militants on the basis of specific theoretic, tactical, and organizational positions, which is to say, on the basis of a more or less perfected homogenous program. Drawing up such a program is one of the primary tasks which the social struggle of recent decades demands of anarchists, and it is to this task that the group of Russian anarchists abroad has dedicated a substantial part of its efforts. The organizational platform published below represents the outline, the skeleton of such a program, and must serve as the first step towards gathering anarchist forces into a single active, revolutionary, anarchist collective capable of struggle, the General Union of Anarchists. We have no illusions about the various deficiencies in the platform. As in any new, practical, and at the same time, critical departure, there are undoubtedly gaps in the platform. It may be that certain essential positions have been left out of the platform, or that certain others have not been developed adequately, or that still others may be too detailed or repetitive. All of this is possible, but that is not the issue. What is important is that the groundwork be laid for a general organization, and that aim is achieved to the necessary extent by this platform. It is the task of the general collective, the general anarchist union, to further elaborate and improve the platform so as to turn it into a complete program for the whole anarchist movement. We also have no illusions on another score. We anticipate that a great many representatives of so-called individualism and chaotic anarchism will attack us, foaming at the mouth and accusing us of infringing anarchist principles. Yet we know that these individualist and chaotic elements take anarchist principles to mean the cavalier attitude, disorderliness, and irresponsibility that have inflicted all but incurable injuries upon our movement and against which we struggle with all our energy and passion. That is why we can calmly parry any attacks from that quarter. Our hopes are vested in others, in those who have remained true to anarchism, the workers, who have lived out the tragedy of the anarchist movement and who are painfully searching for a way out. And we have high hopes of the anarchist youth, those young comrades born on the winds of the Russian Revolution and absorbed from the outset by the whole gamut of constructive problems, who will undoubtedly insist on the implementation of positive organizational principles in anarchism. We invite all Russian anarchist organizations, scattered throughout the various countries of the world, as well as individual anarchist militants, to come together into a single revolutionary collective on the basis of a general organizational platform. May this platform be a revolutionary watchword and rallying point for all the militants of the Russian anarchist movement, and may it mark the birth of the General Union of Anarchists. The Group of Russian Anarchists Abroad Peter Arshinov, Group Secretary 20th of June, 1926. On Revolutionary Discipline by Nestor Makhno in De La Truda, number 7 and 8, December 1925, January 1926. Some comrades have put the following question to me. How do I conceive revolutionary discipline? I take revolutionary discipline to mean the self-discipline of the individual, set in the context of a strictly prescribed collective activity equally incumbent upon all, the responsible policy line of the members of that collective, leading to strict congruence between their practice and their theory. Without discipline in the organization, the vanguard of the revolution, one cannot think of undertaking any serious activity for the cause of the revolution. Without discipline, the revolutionary vanguard cannot be revolutionary vanguard, since, 
if it were in a disorderly, disorganized state. It would be powerless to analyze and provide guidance on the pressing questions of the day, something that, as initiator, the masses would demand of it. I base these positions on observation and experience on the following prerequisites. The Russian Revolution bore within it a content that was essentially anarchist in many respects. Had the anarchists been closely organized, and had they in their actions abided strictly by a well-defined discipline, they would never have suffered the crushing defeat they did. But because the anarchists of all persuasions and tendencies did not represent, not even in their specific groups, a homogeneous collective with a disciplined line of action, they were unable to withstand the political and strategic scrutiny which revolutionary circumstances imposed upon them. Their disorganization reduced them to political impotence, giving birth to two categories of anarchists. One category was made up of those who hurled themselves into the systematic occupation of bourgeois homes, where they set up house and lived in comfort. These are the ones I term the anarchist tourists, who wandered around from town to town in hope of stumbling across a place to live for a time along the way, taking their leisure and hanging around as long as possible to live in comfort and ease. The other category was made up of those who severed all real connections with anarchism, although a few of them inside the USSR are now passing themselves off as the sole representatives of Russian anarchism, and who fairly swooped upon the positions offered them by the Bolsheviks, even when the authorities were shooting anarchists who remained true to their revolutionary credentials by denouncing the Bolsheviks' treachery. In light of these lamentable facts, it will be readily understood why I cannot remain indifferent to the nonchalance and negligence currently to be encountered in anarchist circles. It prevents them from establishing a collective, faced with which those people who grab at anarchism or who are long dead to the cause of anarchism, or who just blabber on about anarchism, its unity and actions against the enemy, but who, when it comes to action, run from this unity, would be seen in a different light and would be pushed away to the place they belong. That is why I am speaking about an anarchist organization that rests upon the principle of comradely discipline. Such an organization would lead to the necessary coordination of all of the living forces of anarchism in the country and would help anarchists to take their rightful place in the great struggle of labor against capital. Only in this way can the idea of anarchism gain a mass following and not be impoverished. The only ones who could balk at such an organizational setup are the irresponsible, empty-headed chatterboxes who have until now almost dominated our movement through our own fault. Responsibility and discipline must not frighten the revolutionary. They are traveling companions of the practice of social anarchism. The Struggle Against the State by Nestor Machno In De Lo Truda, No. 17, October 1926 The fact that the modern state is the organizational form of an authority founded upon arbitrariness and violence in the social life of toilers is independent of whether it may be bourgeois or proletarian. It relies upon oppressive centralism, arising out of the direct violence of a minority deployed against the majority. In order to enforce and impose the legality of its system, the state resorts not only to the gun and money, but also to potent weapons of psychological pressure. With the aid of such weapons, a tiny group of politicians enforces psychological repression of an entire society and, in particular, of the toiling masses, conditioning them in such a way as to divert their attention from the slavery instituted by the state. So it must be clear that if we are to combat the organized violence of the modern state, we have to deploy powerful weapons appropriate to the magnitude of the task. Thus far, the methods of social action employed by the revolutionary working class against the power of the oppressors and exploiters, the state and capital, in conformity with libertarian ideas, were insufficient to lead the toilers on to complete victory. It has come to pass in history that the workers have defeated capital, but the victory then slipped from their grasp because some of the state power emerged, amalgamating the interests of private capital and those of state capitalism for the sake of success over the toilers. The experience of the Russian Revolution has blatantly exposed our shortcomings in this regard. We must not forget that, but should rather apply ourselves to identifying those shortcomings plainly. We may acknowledge that our struggle against the state in the Russian Revolution was remarkable, despite the disorganization which our ranks were afflicted. Remarkable above all insofar as the destruction of that odious institution is concerned. But, by contrast, our struggle was insignificant in the realm of construction of the free society of toilers and its social structures, 
which might have ensured that it prospered beyond the reach of the tutelage of the state and its repressive institutions. The fact that we libertarian communists or anarcho-syndicalists failed to anticipate the sequel to the Russian Revolution, and that we failed to make haste to devise new forms of social activity in time, led many of our groups and organizations to dither yet again in their political and socio-strategic policy on the fighting front of the revolution. If we are to avert a future relapse into these same errors, when a revolutionary situation comes about, and in order to retain the cohesion and coherence of our organizational line, we must first of all amalgamate all of our forces into one active collective, then, without further ado, define our constructive conception of economic, social, local, and territorial units so that they are outlined in detail, free Soviets, and in particular, describe in broad outline their basic revolutionary mission in the struggle against the state. Contemporary life and the Russian Revolution require that. Those who have blended in with the very ranks of the worker and peasant masses, participating actively in the victories and defeats of their campaign, must without doubt come to our own conclusions, and more specifically to an appreciation that our struggle against the state must be carried on until the state has been utterly eradicated. They will also acknowledge that the toughest role in that struggle is the role of the revolutionary armed force. It is essential that the action of the revolution's armed forces be linked with the social and economic unit wherein the laboring people will organize itself from the earliest days of the revolution onwards, so that total self-organization of life may be introduced out of reach of all statist structures. From this moment forth, anarchists must focus their attention upon that aspect of the revolution. They have to be convinced that, if the revolution's armed forces are organized into huge armies or into lots of local armed detachments, they cannot but overcome the state's incumbents and defenders, and thereby bring about the conditions needed by the toiling populace supporting the revolution, so that it may cut all ties with the past and look to the final detail of the process of constructing a new socio-economic existence. The state will, though, be able to cling to a few local enclaves and try to place multifarious obstacles in the path of the toiler's new life, slowing the pace of growth and harmonious development of new relationships founded on the complete emancipation of man. The final and utter liquidation of the state can only come to pass when the struggle of all the toilers is oriented along the most libertarian lines possible, when the toilers will themselves determine the structures of their social action. These structures should assume the form of organs of social and economic self-direction, the form of free, anti-authoritarian Soviets. The revolutionary workers and their vanguard, the anarchists, must analyze the nature and structure of these Soviets and specify their revolutionary functions in advance. It is upon that, chiefly, that the positive evolution and development of anarchist ideas in the ranks of those who will accomplish the liquidation of the state on their own account in order to build a free society will be dependent. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.